The war is not going well for Russia. Putin's propagandists on state TV are making ever more aggressive and genocidal demands against Ukraine, doubling down on the country's right to exist. Hardliners are making their voices heard as never before, and Putin is striking out vindictively against Ukraine. How do we get here? And what is the end game for Putin's regime and his dreams of imperial revanchism? Welcome to the Silicon Curtain podcast. If you enjoy the material we create, then please like and subscribe to help boost their popularity in YouTube. Dr. Precious Chatterjee Doody is a lecturer in politics and international studies at the Open University. She is an expert on Russian foreign policy and security policy, soft power, propaganda narratives, the media and communications, as well as conspiracy theories. She is co-author of the Russia Today and Conspiracy Theories book, People Power and Politics on RT with Ilya Yablokov. Uh, Precious, welcome to the channel. I, I think you have you know very well a few of the people that I've interviewed before, including Ilya and uh, Stephen Hutchins. That's right, yes, and thanks for having me. Thank you so much. Well, let's dive straight into the questions. And this has been a, a tremendously uh, eventful week with the attack on the Kerch Bridge. Um, we still don't know exactly how it happened or who initiated it, but Putin's revenge has been absolutely clear and exacted at peak rush hour yesterday on Ukrainian civilian targets. Could you tell me a bit about this escalation in the war? Yeah, I think there are sort of two sides of this, basically. So the attack on the bridge was strategically um, quite a big deal for Russia, um, not least because that is the primary route for resupply um, back through Crimea. So, you know, it was a, a very important tactical hit, but also symbolically, um, it's very significant to the Russian side that this symbol of Russia's unity with Crimea, so-called reunification with Crimea has been hit because personally Putin himself, he's very invested in that, in that symbolism. Um, we've seen throughout his presidency, uh, presidencies, uh, numerous attempts to, to use symbolism to his advantage for political purposes. Um, and unfortunately, in a way that makes this, uh, this attack seemed personal and I think that's one of the reasons why we've seen such a significant escalation with absolute disregard for civilian casualties. Um, it's because of that duality of the strategic um, difficulties that, that the attack on the bridge has represented and also that kind of symbolic capital that it's taken away from Putin and also other key cronies close to him like Margarita Simonian is also um, very personally um, invested in, in the, the bridge project. She wrote a whole screenplay about a romance, you know, centered on that bridge. Um, so the symbolism is a really important thing, I think. And that's one of the reasons we've seen what you can classify basically as, as retribution um, mm. following that attack. It, it's a pretty bad film, isn't it? I can't say I've seen the thing to the end, but it's it's pretty dreadful stuff. Um, and also one of Putin's key allies is the oligarch who um, who, who built the bridge as well. And the fact that it um, didn't fare so well and sort of whole sections of it have collapsed, perhaps also talk or hint at uh, perhaps the, the quality of construction as well, which reflects badly. I think actually your question leads me into a, a bigger um, pathology of the Putinite system, which is that, you know, once you've been in power at the head of an authoritarian regime for so long, you have had to um, make certain trade offs over time to keep the various um, uh, various elite groups happy um, to keep that level of support behind yourself. And what that essentially means in black and white terms is often payoffs and you know contracts and things like that. But what it does in the longer term is it creates very significant issues for the sustainability of, for example, infrastructure projects, um, for how reliable you can consider that building project to have been. Um, you mentioned it with the bridge, but you can also see this playing out in the the war itself you know at various times we have seen that russian troops have not had the kind of equipment they've needed 
or that equipment that was supposedly um, ready for combat has not been, you know, we saw a lot of tanks, for example, breaking down early on in the war. And this is years and years of um, maintenance that's not been done, but the funding for that has been pocketed. Um, intelligence failures again that's years and years of overblowing how good things look and and not being willing to admit when there's been problems or deficiencies and obviously that means that those problems and deficiencies don't get rectified and so you see it playing out at these crucial points so in a way you can see this is the i guess the inherent instability of a long-term authoritarian system because it might look like they can get things done but actually it's at that surface level and below that there are very very many issues not being dealt with over a long period of time that can come to a crunch point when you see a real strain on the regime as in this this um military operation this war and we've seen incredible examples haven't we from out of date uh, food supplies in uh, soldiers packs to old soviet maps even sort of rubber in what was supposed to be explosive reactive armor um, and now there's these rumours of a hundred, uh, was it uh, one and a half million winter uniforms that have just sort of vanished. And as we head into winter, I mean, all of this graft, corruption and theft, which I think for anyone who's lived in Russia in the 90s is, is no surprise. Um, but to see that play out within an army that was supposed to be the second most powerful in the world, it's it's quite extraordinary, isn't it? It is extraordinary and I think it, it brings to light not only the, the just wholesale nature of that corruption um, and it it does call to mind the same kind of failures, the same kind of informational failures that we saw at the collapse of the Soviet Union. You know, a beautiful kind of Potemkin facade of something that was working uh, on the surface, but actually beneath that multiple, multiple layers of failings um, and, and insufficiencies. And we are seeing that now, we are seeing the consequences of that now. Um, I don't think that that means necessarily that Russia is a spent force, of course, because Russia still has a lot of capacity and also a lot of willingness um, to take steps that perhaps you wouldn't expect or hope to see. For example, these um, deliberate um, kind of rush or peak hour type hits on Kiev um, that we haven't seen for, you know, since the, the, the beginning of the war, this, this kind of action. So I think... Um, Part of it is a sort of desperation um, bringing its way to the fore. You know, this is, like I said, this was a, a hugely important, both strategic and symbolic um, attack on the bridge. And I think we are seeing that in the type of almost emotive response that we're seeing. Um, but nonetheless, beneath that, there are these layers of issues um, that I don't think are going to go away anytime soon. And I think we're going to see many, many more examples of this um, throughout the, the conflict going forwards. And of course, Simonyan and, and uh, Solovyov and the other propagandists, they're trying to frame this attack on the bridge as an attack on civilian infrastructure. Um, but really, the, the civilian use of the bridge is secondary, isn't it? Primarily, it's a, it's a sort of piece of military infrastructure and has been absolutely critical to supply uh, Russian troops in that southern front. Yeah, I think that's a critical point, because one of the things that the Russian side always tries to do um, in these crucial foreign policy examples, crucial security examples, is it will essentially project onto the other side um, its own crimes, I guess. And it, that's I don't think that's too strong a word um, to use. So, yes, they are trying to um, portray this as being an attack on civilian infrastructure. They're doing that to gain um, some level of if not support then acquiescence um, internationally, as well as domestically, but I, I think we'll probably talk about that later on, it's a slightly different picture. Um, but they're in particular trying to court um, different states that are not fully bought into Western sanctions and Western action against Russia. So we're talking about the global south, we're talking about states that have a sort of um, anti-imperial mindset, I guess, that Russia has courted over years with a kind of rising power type narrative. Um, so that's why they're trying to portray it as an attack on the civilian infrastructure. But in fact, we have seen, first of all, you know, the whole construction of the bridge. This is a bridge from um, an annexed territory to the occupying power. So in that regard, it was never um, just a neutral 
piece of infrastructure anyway. And yes, we have seen it used precisely to transport military hardware th through to um, Crimea and from Crimea onwards into the, the general arena of conflict. We've seen many, many instances of tanks using that bridge, various other um, weaponry being taken in through that route. So it's very clear that its primary purpose throughout this conflict has been a military one. I don't think that's in question and I think it's a clear attempt to muddy the waters by, by um, putting out that narrative from the Russian side because it sort of um, gives a bit of cover then to any supposed collateral damage of Russia's um, response when in fact even that is not collateral damage, as we were talking about earlier. These are deliberate attacks at peak times on civilian, you know, clearly civilian areas, built up areas. Um, so I think there's a very clear reason why they're portraying it that way, but it absolutely doesn't reflect the reality of the situation. And it's a terror strategy, isn't it? It's quite clearly terrorism. And I think a lot of people, especially Ukrainians, are labelling it as such. Um, what does it tell us, however, about the other threat that Putin's been making? And this is the nuclear sabre rattling, because one of the fears, of course, was that by hitting the Kerch Bridge, that might escalate and cause uh, Putin to adopt the tactical nuclear weapons. The fact that he's gone for conventional, untargeted vengeance for want of a better word does this tell us that actually the nuclear uh, scenario is a bluff or is he perhaps holding that uh, for when Ukraine makes far greater gains in inroads into uh, the occupied territories um, I don't think you can dismiss the nuclear saber rattling as pure bluff um, but I do think you know although we look at what the Putin regime is doing as being pretty much beyond the pale. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's completely irrational. And I've heard, uh, you know, people dismiss uh, the whole military operation as just insanity, you know, uh, it's got the power has gone to Putin's head, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. I actually don't think that's very useful, because according to his own priorities, he is pursuing the kind of actions that he thinks he needs to do um, to pursue them. And that would be partly um, to achieve some sort of uh, military advantages, but a lot of it is to do with the stabilization of the regime at home. And those things are interlinked in the way that this war is being played out. And that's why things that might not seem initially strategically sensible decisions purely in the field of combat, that's why those decisions are being made because they're not purely about the field of com combat, mm. they're also in stabilizing his position at home. Um, so I think that's quite an important part of it. Um, I don't, the difficulty is I don't think the nuclear option is off the table, but I see that there are clear alternatives, alternative types of escalation um, that the Russian regime can turn to. And what we have seen in Kiev in the past few days is part of that. Now, I, I think there are many other ways in which it can be escalated short of strategic nuclear weapons. Um, and I expect that that's what we would see in the first instance. Nonetheless, we have seen, particularly from those key Kremlin propagandists, we have seen a sort of incremental preparing of the way towards justification or um, uh, filtering almost of a potential strategic nuclear strike. So uh, it's been talked about for months already um, in terms of a, a theoretical possibility or that the capacity is there, whilst also stating that, you know, it's, it's you know, we would never do such a thing um, unnecessarily. Um, we are seeing, I think, more militant rhetoric on this. We're also seeing some resistance to this. Um, even through those official, official channels, we're seeing the kind of a slight debate about whether that's a sensible direction to go in. Um, but I think that's a pattern we see replicated often actually in Russia's foreign policy misadventures is that you almost get this narrative preparing of the ground for multiple options um, so that there's something to jump and run with already almost in the in the psychological system for when whatever action happens next does happen next. It's like a almost covering of all bets, I think, in advance. And it's confusing, isn't it? Because sometimes throwing out these multiple narratives is part of the 
propaganda technology, isn't it? It's to muddy the waters. Other times, it seems to be doing a little bit what Trump used to do, which was just throw multiple ideas out there and see what sticks to the wall, like, you know, throwing spaghetti against the wall. Um, and I guess in a society that doesn't have uh, you know, the normal sort of um, media and political mechanisms to, to capture public opinion, this is maybe the next best thing, which is to see what the responses are to different narratives through state TV. But as, a, as an expert in this field, do you sometimes find it difficult to sort of pick apart the intentions behind these conflicting and confusing narratives? Yeah, it, it can be quite hard to pick apart the atten intentions behind them. And I think that's partly because um, we, I think we do the Russian propagandists a favor by assuming that they have a really clear master plan, which they're putting into action. I don't think that does reflect reality. It is very much more of a spaghetti at the wall kind of scenario. Um, and I think that's, uh, in some ways, that's where we make our mistakes, because we imagine, you know, we have Putin at the top, master strategist, puppet master, and then propagandists preparing the way, you know, in the specific ways that he says. Actually, I think in a lot of ways, he's more reactionary than that, you know, so for example, we look at this attack on the bridge, um, as yet unclear exactly um, who's responsible for that. But certainly from Putin's perspective, it almost doesn't matter. He has to make the assumption that that's, um, you know, that there is Ukrainian culpability and he has to come down hard against that because he has to manage his own hardliners at home who are essentially quite doubtful about how the, the, the conduct of the war is going um, for understandable reasons, of course. Um, but that then means that there is a real clear need to do something. Mm. Um, and short of that escalation to a strategic nuclear strike, then, you know, these attacks on civilian um, targets, I think, is, is you can see it in exactly that way as this kind of escalation. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think it is hard to pick the narratives apart, but primarily because there's a lot going on there and there's a lot of bets being hedged, essentially. And I think viewers of this channel will, will find the idea quite horrific given the brutality and in our eyes extreme um, actions that Putin has initiated having said that you talk about the hardliners here being dissatisfied and they may be a small minority but they're an extremely vociferous one and they're one which unlike the liberal minority is is actually more or less tolerated by the regime rather than locked up um some of their points of view actually make Putin look like a more of a rational actor don't they and that's kind of quite scary to think there are extreme views extreme nationalist even genocidal imperial views there and that they're quite substantial and they're quite powerful um and yet whatever they're calling for is not built on any kind of political or military logic is it it is built on a political and military mm -hmm. logic but it's one kind of so far out of um the the general comfort zone we might want to sit within that it's hard to see how it has a place in the contemporary world right you know it is precisely informed by genocidal imperialism and that's something that we as liberal westerners might have consigned to the past but it is absolutely a kind of almost coherent worldview that has informed very many states in the past and that is very much informing this russian um, far right wing now Putin's problem is that this has been, as you say, quite a vocal contingent for a very long time, and he has attempted to um, uh, to build, I guess, on their organisation and to use it for his own advantage in the past. Um, and he's done that with some elements of success. Uh, you know, you can see, for example, in the taking of Crimea in the first place, um, this was very much kind of building on that um, Russian right uh, impulse, but very quickly that love affair between Putin and the Russian right started to sour because precisely because for them he wasn't going far enough. Um, you know, he isn't a true believer as such. He's sort of a pragmatist, quite a cynical pragmatist who will use those contingents to the extent that he can. Um, and so the Russian right kind of fell out of love with, with Putin. And we're seeing that again in this situation where he's attempting to keep on board the far right, but also 
can't fully um, appease them without then alienating other contingents that he's got to appease. So uh, not that I want to sound overly sympathetic to him, but he is kind of between a rock and a hard place. And again, this speaks to why we can't necessarily see a um a coherent strategy feeding its way throughout the conflict because it's almost like trying to juggle multiple balls and taking the least worst option in each instance i think and i think there are there are some experts aren't they who've looked into his his childhood and uh, you know he was uh, something of a, of a brawler on the streets and one of the predictors of behavior is that when cornered he comes out fighting. He comes out essentially using his metaphorical fists and he will escalate. And that seems to be in the case. That seems to be the one common predictor of his actions and behavior throughout this conflict is he will not de-escalate. He will not look for that, you know, that infamous off ramp, which uh, is often talked about by appeasers and fellow travelers and so on. Um, he's always looking to um, escalate on the understanding that his opponents, especially in the West, will be more timid, will be much more, as you say, I won't say rational, but their, 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 their frame of reference is uh, to much sort of softer, and I dare say it more civilized form of, of foreign policy. Um, he, he, he doesn't have those same kind of uh, inhibitions, does he? So he can escalate without any kind of moral check. Yeah, I think so for me, I, I get a little bit uncomfortable if we try and put any of his actions down to things like his childhood and maybe mm -hmm. psychologists can do that. I don't feel comfortable doing it. And um, even, you know, if you look at his sort of martial arts background, one of the principles is of judo is not that you just attack, right? It's that you use your opponent's strength against them, that you take the momentum of their attacks and run with it. Um and so I guess if you were going to make an analogy in a way that's quite a useful one, because you do see very often that Russia will um, make official charges against its opponents that essentially reveal what's going on inside Russia. So they'll telegraph things in terms of, you know, the West is planning um, a strategic nuclear strike, which then they will blame on us. You know, that's that's that kind of thing. We've heard that before in regards to very many other conflicts um, where essentially the Russian side will telegraph what its aspirations or hopes or ideas are, but mirror that back um, onto, other part, uh, onto other parties. Um, so I think that kind of analogy can be a little bit useful, but part of this issue, part of this um, difficulty with de-escalation is I think precisely down to more rational factors, which is if, a big part of your domestic support does come from those hard right contingents that have a much more militaristic outlook, then you can't be seen to be weak. And Putin has over many, many years built up his entire political persona on the perception of strength. Now, if that is your USP, your total brand, then to start to mess with that, absolutely undermines your position. So we can see it in very much more present, more rational terms as to why he is unwilling to lose face in this way. Um, and so the, the kind of any sort of off ramp option that would involve a, a loss of face, I think is not gonna happen. Um, I think we have to be a lot more thoughtful, a lot more careful about how we um, game out the progression and the end stages of this war because um that it's just not an option that kind of loss of face is just not mm. an option um and i think it's becoming rapidly very clear with each escalation that we see with each with each really disproportionate response that we see like the bridge and the attacks on kiev you know it's not just escalation it is you know, complete disproportion. Um, and again, it's partly to do with that maintaining of a facade of the strong man at home. Mm. I mean, and, and sometimes it feels a bit, doesn't it, like the West has come to a, a knife fight with a Nerf gun or something. You know, we, we, we're we not playing the same game as him. Um, and we're not targeting his allies like Lukashenko. We're, we're, we're giving them a free pass, even though 
uh, especially recently, you know, a lot of the missiles have come from Belarusian territory. Um, they've used their transport infrastructure, certainly in the early stages of the war, um, to really support this invasion in quite a major way. Um, and then, you know, Putin has very few allies in the world, but Lukashenko, you can rely on him to uh, to sort of toe the line mostly. I mean, we're 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 just we just don't seem to have a plan, and we don't seem to have any idea of what the end game or what end game we would actually like. We're just relying on events to play themselves out. I think, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about the inherent pathologies of an authoritarian system, and now we're coming to the inherent pathologies of a democratic system. Because when Putin wants to take action, um, as long as he's got his kind of key uh, cronies on board and his kind of key interest groups, then he can go ahead or he can go ahead and then buy off those key interest groups. Mm. That doesn't happen in a democratic system. And when it's an allied response to Russian aggression, there are a lot of parties to get on board. And that's one of the issues that we're seeing is that it's impossible to get unanimity on pretty much anything. So it, it does become a much more piecemeal um, response or um, more uh, sort of in more stages, I guess, than necessarily being as quick as we would like. Um, I think the Belarus factor is a significant one. Um, and I would like to see a lot more attention paid play to that vector in the conflict because um, you know it's it, it opens up, I think, a whole um new, well not new, but significant front at least, um, that we we ignore at our peril, I think. Um, and you know, the the Belarusian people have been through an awful lot in the past few years and they have you know come out very much fighting there's a lot of resistance there um I think in in a lot of ways there's a, a lot more um kind of popular groundswell of resistance in Belarus than there is in Russia for example because in Russia it's been possible to kind of ignore what's going on at the top levels of government and pretty much live a comfortable life up till now um in Belarus uh I think the people have really been quite galvanized for quite a lot of years, increasingly so in most recent years and since the, the latest um, sham election there. Um, and so I think we should be doing a lot more to kind of court Belarusian civil society and and think about the ways that we can, um, you know, have, have, have more of a grassroots um, opposition to the military um, operations from Belarus. Um, that said, we are always, as democratic societies, going to have difficulties coming together in a coherent way. It's it's the nature of the beast, right? Um, it does bring with it certain benefits too, of course, even in military benefits, I would say, you know, the Russian intelligence failures that we've seen are because Russia is primarily relying on its own corrupted intelligence system, whereas Ukraine is getting intelligence from a number of different international parties. And so that's one of the reasons it's managed to almost kind of outperform compared to what would have been expected because it's got this stuff going on behind the scenes that is reliable, that does inform operations in a way that Russia can't even really hope for, I think. Um, so I think all of these things are gonna to continue to have quite a significant um, impact on the way that the conflict plays out. I'd love to dig into that uh, that idea you just mentioned there of key differences between Ukraine and Russia, because if we go back a few years, I mean, Ukraine has diverged significantly uh, from Russia in the, in the post-Soviet era, but at the same time, it also had extremely influential oligarchs, it had um, endemic corruption, its economy for, for a time was certainly behind the growth seen in the Russian economy. Obviously, Russia is much more fueled by um, you know, gas and oil assets and so on. Um, and for a while, it did look like the sort of political turbulence and chaos, the, the birthing pains of Ukraine democracy were holding it back economically. But this war, I think, has highlighted that actually significant changes have taken place uh, behind the scenes at a deep level, as you say, within civil society. Could you outline some of those differences uh, between Ukraine and Russia, which mean that Ukraine, against all the odds and all expectations, is, is winning, and Russia, with its far greater military resources, um, is, is losing badly. I think there are several elements to this. If you look purely at the kind of economic side, uh, one of the reasons that Ukraine seemed to be doing worse in comparison to Russia um, 
was because Russia essentially maintains neo-colonial relations with various um, local partners. So you look at things like the Eurasian Economic Union project that Russia started up, and you look at the benefits accrued to the different partners in that, and the benefits to Russia far outweighed the benefits to any other members. You know, so that's that's part of it. Russia um, was gaining some financial benefit but kind of at the expense of others now obviously with with ukrainian divergence from this whole model um there are teething pains there of course there are and i think that's one of the reasons that we saw that now that being the case there have been very significant changes in ukrainian society over the past few years we have absolutely seen that sort of um explosion i guess of civil society um, and that has, you know, that dates back several years, but certainly in the context of precisely this war, we have seen Ukrainian national identity and Ukrainian civil society absolutely galvanized in the face of Russian aggression. And there is this, you know, almost joke now that nobody has done as much to unify the Ukrainian nation as Putin. And I definitely think it's true. Um, you can see this in some of the responses to criticism of the leaders on both sides. So if you look at the way that the war is turning out now, there is large scale dissatisfaction in Russia amongst the kind of close to elite groups about how that war is going on. And there's an attempt to shift the blame to work out who is to blame. And yet at the moment for most of those groups, there's no question of blaming Putin directly. So it must be the fault of the generals in the army who gave false intelligence or, you know, were incompetent at their jobs. Um, or it's the fault of NATO because Russia's actually fighting NATO, not Ukraine. Um, or uh, it's the fault of the Ministry of Defense, maybe. You know, we've seen all these kind of narratives articulated, but it's not Putin's fault. Now, more recently, although Zelensky has enjoyed very high popularity throughout the war, there's been a bit more criticism of him uh, voiced precisely because um, he has uh, let slip or admitted in an interview um, that he had more credible um, intelligence about the Russian invasion before it happened and people are essentially angry that he didn't order an evacuation of the most at-risk areas and yet the response to that is yes to articulate that anger yes to argue that he deserves to be criticized for it that it was the wrong call and that nonetheless we are going to park that until this threat is dealt with and that's a, a recurrent theme i've seen from multiple commentators that yeah he deserves to be criticized about it but right now he's galvanizing this resistance and we need to stick behind him and that's almost like a kind of conscious um societal decision i think but that criticism is allowed to take place it is taking place and that's very different from the russian system where even the the mere suggestion that critiques of the system could be leveled all the way up to the head of that system. It's just almost beyond the pale, even in the circumstances that we're in now. So I think that that's a really nice illustration of the differences between those two systems. Mm. And it's 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 as you say, it's a systemic difference, isn't it? Because um, Ukraine was attacked in 2014. Its army was by all accounts completely unprepared uh without the equipment the training strategy to really oppose russia they managed to freeze the front lines but they were caught off guard um they've had eight years to transform their strategies their organizations to go from a more vertical structure to a more horizontal type structure to build up that middle level of, of officers that will take initiative and so on so a completely different philosophy of war uh Plus, they've been slowly sort of, you know, rearming and re-equipping. So what you've got in Ukraine is people with direct experience over a long period of time of, of actual frontline warfare, tactics, strategy and organization. Could you comment a bit on, on, on the Russian similar, uh, on the Russian sort of differences with that? Because someone like Shoigu has never even served, let alone been in a combat situation. Isn't it a sort of, it, much more of a historic thing. And this, I think, Tsarist times had, had a similar, you know, when you join the Russian army and you, you look to become a senior officer, it's not so much that you're becoming a military um, expert, 
you're actually creating a little business for yourself. You're creating an opportunity to earn, to graft, to have juniors, let's say, build your dacher, serve you, do sort of stuff. It's almost like a, a, a little zardom by itself. It's a money-making opportunity rather than a pure military career. I might have, you know, exaggerated or simplified there, but is there some truth in that? And does that ladder back to Russia's failure? I think there is some truth to that kind of portrayal. Um, you know, we know about in the Russian system just how significant corruption is. And you can see it as a crony system. People are not promoted on the basis of their capabilities, but on the basis of their loyalty, basically. And as we know from many other systems, including democratic ones sometimes, you know, when you promote people based purely on their political loyalty, um, you are essentially not promoting the best people and there will be longer term consequences of that over time. And you might get away with that in peacetime. Um, in wartime, those kind of deficiencies really come to the fore. The big important contrast, I think, with the Ukrainian situation is that 2014 absolutely was a real a wake up call. So it's not just that since then we've had this sort of incremental um, uh, structural changes in Ukraine, but also what we saw was essentially a big old purge of those traitorous elements within um, the Russian security force, uh, sorry, within the Ukrainian security forces. Um, and so that took out a big blocker, I think, on reform and also um, helped to create space for then promotions by capacity rather than by um, cronyism. And, and so there's, there's a really big contrast then in the, the, the overall sort of structural makeup, I think, that are having these long term effects that we can see in stark relief now. And what can we expect then? Um over the coming months uh, from the Ukrainian counteroffensive, because yes, we're focusing on the Kerch Bridge at the moment, but nonetheless, Ukrainian armies are still pushing forward uh, with their rapid advance in the east, trying to gain as much territory as they can before the winter sets in. So how is this likely to play out over the coming months? Well, I think you've mentioned the key point, which is winter. I think for the Ukrainian side, it's, it's going to be very important to make, um, as many advances as possible whilst it is possible because once we come to winter I think that's one of the things that the Russian side is really kind of hoping to wait out if they can freeze that conflict over winter they've got time to regroup to at least um, train some of those new conscripts the newly mobilized um, contingents as well um, and things might look different in the new year so I think for the Ukrainian side building on that momentum is very important um, and keeping that momentum going. So I would not be surprised to see um, attempts at significant um, incursions into Russian held territory. Um, of course, we it, it would be foolish to anticipate exactly where they're going to occur now, I think, because one thing that the Ukrainian side has proven it's learned a lot about is misdirection. You know, one of the key reasons that the initial counteroffensive was so uh, successful was because they telegraphed that they would be making an, an offensive in the south and actually um, instead they went east, which was a very sensible thing to do. Obviously, now that's been done, there's going to be much more Russian wariness about um, how to interpret those signals from the Ukrainian side. Um, but I do think that that's where the emphasis is going to be, is going to be trying to make and hold as many gains as possible um, whilst it's possible to do so. And whilst the Russian side remains almost on the back foot, um, kind of underprepared, under-resourced and almost stymied by those additionally mobilised troops that have very little use at the minute, but could prove to be more useful later on, given that time. And I guess they're going to carry on using systems like HIMARS to effectively take out Russia's logistical networks, their um, ammunition dumps, supply dumps. This seems to be extremely effective, doesn't it? Because even though Russia still potentially has the advantage in artillery pieces, they're not able to get their supplies, ammo, and even the expertise uh, to, to use that equipment effectively. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think this goes then hand in hand with the way in which territory has been retaken, because if you can attack those um, supply sites, but then you can also retake key logistical points, it's like a double whammy, isn't it? You know, you're really disrupting that resupply and, and hindering the, the war effort for Russia 
in a, in a much longer term perspective. So I think we have seen and we are seeing the more like medium to longer term results of that, of those new territorial acquisitions, plus the disruption of, of um, Russian supply sites, absolutely. And I think that's a very um, sensible strategy. I don't think that's going to go anywhere. And you mentioned conscription being unlikely to have any major impact on, on actual Russia's success at the front, especially as many of the people being thrown at the front lines have limited to no combat experience. Is the implication of conscription far more onerous, perhaps, for the domestic front and in making an already fragile system, destabilizing it further? I mean, how do you see that conscription playing out? Is it going to ratchet up? Is that going to cause, you know, more protests against mobilization? Could it even push people to, uh, you know, more, let's say, more terrorist methods within Russia to oppose the regime? I definitely don't think it's out of the question. You know, it's not um, it's not a coincidence that the biggest, most coordinated um, opposition that we've seen to the war has come directly after the mobilization. Now, I don't want to be one of those cynics that says, you know, nobody cares unless it affects them. But it is a very human thing that you care more when it affects you more. And a lot of people were able to um, quietly disapprove of what was going on without having any skin in the game. Um, now, that's not the case. So I think, um, you know, there are definitely going to be some um, tactical detriments, I think, to Russia from having this mass mobilization. We have already seen significant um, public protest against the mobilization. Um, particularly in some of the um, Caucasian regions where people seem to be disproportionately mobilized, but also in central regions now as well, you know, Moscow and St. Petersburg have had their fair share, um, because this is something that, you know, it's impossible now to deny is happening. Um, and as it affects more and more people and more and more families, I think, of course, we are going to see um, more opposition to that. Um, the other sort of protective factor to some extent is in the poorer regions where people are being disproportionately mobilized. Uh, the attempts to sort of buy off families, I think, work better. You know, these are areas where unemployment is high and where the pull of a military salary is it means something. But there are increasing reports of people not getting paid. So that then kind of wipes out that potential benefits. When you go to the large population centers like Petersburg and Moscow, um, the pull of that pay doesn't have such a strong um, meaning because, you know, these people essentially they aren't as desperate. And so they, you know, you don't get that initial bump of the mm. bribe. Um, and so I think that absolutely that the longer this goes on and that the more people are mobilized, we will see increasing ex expressions of, of public dissent and probably a lot more um, interesting and imaginative ways of expressing that and probably more violent ways too. And I, I mean, just to, just on that point of the bribes, I mean, there've been some extraordinary stories, haven't they? With uh, you know, in some regions, people being paid in you know six kilograms of frozen fish, and another one, it's a, a shed full of uh, wood for the winter. And in certain poor areas, it tells you something, doesn't it? That that is a significant resource. Whereas, of course, in St. Petersburg, Moscow, you know, those kind of bribes, or even a larder when your, uh, you know, when your offspring don't make it back, that's not really going to cut it, is it? That's not a fair exchange for those in the larger cities. Yeah, exactly. And I think even the fact that we are talking about the differenti differentiation of bribes, it's just yet another stark example of the way that the Russian state operates on this kind of neo-colonial model, you know, even within its suppose you know, its, its own supposed territories, this these internal republics, but we see very much you know neo-colonial relations and this reckless disregard for human life regardless of whether it's ukrainian life or russian life you know it's it's across the board basically um it repeats themes we have seen i think through the soviet period and through um russia's post-soviet period that the people are essentially seen as one more resource for the state you know you get economic resources you get human resources and what you do with them is you use them as fits the state's needs we are at a position now where 
the Putin regime is conflating its own needs with the needs of the state. So these lives are essentially being thrown at the perpetuation of the regime as much as they are at the expansion of the state. And I think that that um, the facade, the facade of something greater than that, of a big project, it's very much teetering on the brink, I think. And in a lot of cases, it's less painful for Russian people to accept that facade, because if you have lost loved ones in the war, you would much rather believe that they're fighting Nazism than that they were just, you know, human cannon fodder. Um, but I think the longer this goes on, the harder it's going to be to maintain that facade. And, and of course, Russians, I mean, I've talked to, to a number of people about this. Uh, Russians are very capable of maintaining multiple conflicting narratives in their heads at one time. And uh, it might be difficult for us to understand that, but but making them sort of uh, making them sort of gel and not worrying too much about the logical inconsistencies there. Um, so people, you know, I remember from, from when I was there, people know very well about the corruption. They know very well. Uh, about what's going on they have a much better understanding I think of the kind of society they're living in than, than we think they do and they also have a much better set of knowledge about the outside world than we expect as well and you'd expect with that information with that knowledge you'd expect some kind of resistance but at the same time you have this historical idea of the imperial project of the state um, be more important than the individual. And as you say, people might not like the war, but when it comes to, you know, um, what has the higher priority, is it their patriotism as a, as, as, as not, I won't say citizen, because they're not citizens, but, you know, is it patriotism or personal interest? And, you know, we would tend to choose our own individual self-interest, but a lot of Russians will choose patriotism they will put those logical inconsistencies to one side um in favor of the state and the state is almost conflated with this imperial project as well isn't it so where, where do you go with all that stuff i mean i think it's important to remember that cognitive cognitive dissonance it's not the preserve of the russian people we are all guilty of it at times and there's a reason that it is this mm, common human feature and it's because it makes life easier you know sometimes it is just too hard to pick apart those competing um, narratives and competing ideas and chart an individual way forward um, for all of us it is easier to kind of fit in to go with the flow um, and I think that's a large part of what's going on in Russia is that if you can go with the flow it's easier it's when that imposes significant and direct costs on you that then that calculus of costs changes and that you're more likely, for example, to protest. Mm. Um, and so I think that's one of the reasons that we are seeing increased protests with the mobilization, because it is a calculus and it's a calculus of risk too. You know, the costs of protesting in Russia, they are not small, they really are significant. Um, and to undo essentially years and years and years of propaganda you know, about this big state project. As we mentioned, there are people living in the backwaters of Russia who have just horrific day-to-day -day living conditions that for a state as large and, and comparatively rich as Russia, it is just inconceivable. And so how do you reconcile a state that literally couldn't care less about you with continuing to live your daily life? In a, in a kind of drudgery that you have to get on with. Mm. And so sometimes the idea of a bigger project of some sort of messianic role, you know, that can have pull because it gives meaning to those daily sufferings. And so I think that's one of the reasons that these recurrent historical narratives have so much power. And when you can refer to events far in the past that are beyond majority living memory, it's much easier to recast them in new and politically expedient ways. So we can see the kind of reference to World War II myths. Um, the majority of the people that they're directed at don't have direct experience of World War II. They only have that filtered version that they were taught in school through manipulated textbooks um, or through dramatizations that they see on the TV, for example, again, manipulated dramatizations, always a very partial view. And so that can be used to give a much more 
um, meaningful, idealistic vision of what it means to be Russian and, and the, the role that Russia plays in the world than what we might see as outsiders looking in. And so when you've got that whole um, cacophony of, of historical representations from education, from cultural production, just bombarded in everyday life, you know, with victory parades and that kind of thing, it's such a small step to accepting that as just the way things are. Um, and so I think that plays a really important role in understanding why people are reacting in the way that they are, because they have had lifetimes inculcating them to see things in this kind of militaristic messianic way. And this is, this is the topic I'd like to sort of end on, if, 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 I, if I could, with this sort of last question. And it's around this different in, in difference in the sort of informational and cultural spheres you get in Ukraine and Russia, because these same sort of czarist Soviet myths would have been fed to, to both populations, more or less. Um, and there would have been some consistency in, say, textbooks, history books, and perhaps repression of you know, the non-canonical history, the more complex version of history would have been repressed. We now see in Ukraine clearly a more um, national version of history, a sort of emerging, perhaps a more complex and, and nuanced one. In Russia, it's going the other way, isn't it? And that's reflected not only in history and education and the simplification of narratives that align with political goals, it's then drummed in, isn't it, through the information sphere, which is the propagandists, the sort of um, combative formats they have on TV, even through soap operas, historical dramas, at some level, everything kind of aligns with what the regime wants you to think. Yeah, it's very interesting how over the years, I mean, even if we look at just post-Soviet Russia, um, there are so many examples of how um, the state has involved itself in these kind of cognitive projects that perhaps don't look like much on the surface. So there are the things that are obvious, like the um, the call to create patriotic history textbooks, for example. You know, that's like an obvious intervention into schools. And it's not for nothing that one of the first interventions um, in the annexed regions has been educational, that they are kind of looking at installing pro-Russian textbooks basically because that creates your firm foundation for any sort of cognitive building later on but we've seen very many other um, examples in the Russian context of state support for um, you know dramatizations on TV um, and funding basically um, you know quite particular historical narratives about even distant times in the past um, but that give a sort of glorious version of Russian history um, and I think this is something that's happened in many ways over time in Russia. And um, it's almost, it's, it's unquestioned really. It's just, that's kind of how things are done. It's, it's just part of the fabric of everyday life. And if you see that every day, it does become unquestioned and almost unquestion, unquestionable. Um, it doesn't seem to be something out of the ordinary. Um, so as I say, this is, you know, very, the clear reason why um, the educational situation in the annexed regions, I think, has been given priority, even though, you know, we've still got military operations going on, but the Russian side absolutely understands the importance and the potential um, cognitive capital to be made from these sort of historical manipulations. Um, and I think if you look as well at the sort of broader span of Russian education, it is it is conducted along military lines. You know, history isn't just conceived of in a general way, but things that are um, considered to be significant historical events that you might have to learn in school or memorize by year, they tend to be military or territorial acquisitions. You know, that's how history is defined and is pinpointed essentially through a sort of military lens. Um, and all of this does then feed into a society that's very easy, I think, to militarise in that way, in that very general way, as it just being, you know, glorious and, and normal, unquestioned. So, you know, social developments, cultural diversity, uh, these things are going to be downplayed significantly in favour of, as you say, a more militaristic type of history. Yeah, absolutely. Um I don't know if there's anything else you want to say there. I know we're sort of almost out of time here, but um, I, I won't ask to predict what's going to happen next, because I think we're at a point where 
it's almost impossible to know either in Russia or in Ukraine. Well, victory in Ukraine is perhaps a little more assured, but it's it's almost impossible, isn't it, to to, to know what the next 12 months is going to is going to hold. It is. And I also think it's very um, it's tempting because it's comfortable to be a little bit blasé about it. Um, and I think that's a danger as well, because I think the Russian side have got more tricks up their sleeve. And I think that if it if we get too self assured in the idea that Ukraine is doing well, I think it sort of almost undermines that support for Ukraine on which its success is absolutely contingent. And I think it's really important to keep that message going because certainly as winter rolls on in the UK, where we're kind of experiencing financial difficulties as a state, and, and in the US as well, we're seeing quite um, significant resistance to expenditure towards Ukraine as well from the, from the, the American right. I think it's quite important to make clear that Ukraine's victory is not assured and it is very much contingent on international solidarity. I also think it's worth trying to build broader international solidarity beyond the West as well, because those are precisely the kind of countries that Russia is targeting with its informational operations, trying to undermine the idea of, of a sort of a global consensus on this. And you'll find that, you know, since Russia's international broadcaster RT was banned across um, the EU, um, UK, US, you can't get it now. Um, but actually, they've almost changed their orientation and they're really attempting to court the Indian audience now, and that fits very much with these supposed narratives of anti-imperialism, um, which if you scratch the surface are obvious nonsense given that Russia conducts itself as a neo-imperial state, but yet it's trying to present its, um, its operations in Ukraine in that way to try and gain more international support. So I think it's very important for the, the Ukraine supporters to really step on that basically to make clear that there's no truth to this um, and to try and more actively court the global south I think. And those those propaganda narratives there's also been an uptick in Africa the Middle East and as you say India and of course China despite not being a uh, a full throttled partner of Russia in this you know they're not supplying weapons but the propagandists uh, within the Chinese government are, are perfectly happy to to trot out the Russian line on on many of these aren't they so there are there are still considerable risks and there's still considerable you know fire hose of propaganda gushing out of the Kremlin uh, around the world yeah I think that you know none of this is going to go away you know Russia's attempt to play its war is always going to be supported by these key strategic narratives, which we have to be very active in, um, not sort of fact checking as such, but confronting in a positive way. So not letting the Russian side set that narrative, but having very, very, very clear narratives of our own, I think is, is crucial for this. That's an incredibly important statement, I think, to end on. And I really appreciate the amount of time you spent talking uh, with fantastic insights, Precious. Um, I know our audience are going to enjoy this video. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me.